after being there, because all the thermal effects are gone into giving you the free energy, which is not actually equal to the energy. Here, all the effects of the true H bar have gone into giving you the gamma. And then it would appear that you're solving a kind of classical equation motion. The only warning is the classical equation of motion, but with the I epsilon prescription rather than retarded Green's functions for solving. So we talked a little bit about that last time. Okay, so done with this. Now, why are we doing oh I want to say one more crucial thing that comes up a lot in StatMec and it comes up a lot in particle physics. It's very important, but I will not be sort of making a big deal of it uh, in these lectures, but you 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 gotta know there's one beautiful feature of this thing, and that is that it's, a, it's about symmetries. So until we get to gauge symmetries, which are however subtle, uh, well, actually, we'll, we'll do something interesting. Um, we have not been sort of hammering home a lot about symmetries in this course, except for Lorentz and Lorentz. Um, but let me make the statement. shares the same symmetries as the original action. Uh, so for example, this gamma, look, it's this horrible mess, and there are all these functions, explicit functions of x1 up to xn here. But nevertheless, this is Lorentz invariant, because this is Lorentz invariant. And uh, so, so why does it why does it share the same thing? Because a symmetry of S of phi implies a symmetry of W of J by what's called Spurion analysis, which some of you may have heard of. All of you should have heard of. It's a useful tool. For example, um, when you when you write this term, so you're in the path integral, you have s, but actually you end up adding this term. And this term might be j might be zero on the south pole, ten on the north pole, etc. etc. So so this term is actually breaking Lorentz invariant by the choice of the j that you have. Okay. But we don't for the for the for the point that we're making now. We don't want to think of J as some particular set of C numbers relevant to your experiment. We don't want to do that. We want to think of J as a variable. And the quick way to say it is, this is Lorentz invariant. If we call J a scalar field. So if this is a scalar, this is a scalar, this integral is actually Poincaré invariant. That's obvious. Now, after that, we can, we can decide to choose J to be whatever we want. But we're thinking of it as a scalar field. So this W of J, W is a Lorentz invariant function of this scalar field, right? Because we never broke Lorentz invariance in this entire path integral. So, again, you can convince yourself. This Legendre transform of this Lorentz invariant is not suddenly going to point to some vector in space like this. How would it know which direction to point to? Okay. Start with the Lorentz invariant quantity here, and then you do some Legendre transform. All the equations here are okay. So this gamma is going to have to be Lorentz invariant. If you thought that was too slick, you would do a diagram and say, well, really? Is how could that possibly work? In, in the diagram form, it's even more obvious. Okay, here's some x, y, and we're talking about this, say, gamma 4 contribution, and it looks like g squared of x minus y. Of course, that's right? 
So, but but so Lorentz invariants, we're not that surprised. It's just diagrams. Anyway. How about something else? How about uh, phi goes to minus phi? So in phi to the fourth field, the action has phi to the has the symmetry. Oh my God! Look, this term is broken. Phi goes to minus phi symmetry. Unless I assign a spurious transformation law. See, at the end of the day, you're going to choose J to be 10 or something instead of minus 10. So at the end of the day, you're going to choose the J to not have the symmetry. But as, as the variable J, this term is certainly invariant under J goes to minus J, phi goes to minus phi. There's no question. Okay? So this implies that when you do the functional integral over phi, that w of j is equal to w of minus j. Right pattern will form. This is obvious. But again, this Legendre transform, it, if I assign phi bar the same If I assign phi bar the same transformation law as phi, then this thing here implies that gamma of phi bar is equal to gamma of minus phi bar. So it is a very trivial statement to say that gamma, that the effective action shares the same symmetries as the action. It's a very useful thing because the effective action, like the free energy in StatMech, is a very useful device when thinking about symmetry breaking and, and phase transitions where, it, where it's something you get it's, it's a, a broken symmetry, where the, where the ground state or the thermal averages uh, end up uh, spontaneously choosing positive over negative symmetry. Okay. Um, spontaneous magnetization, that's the classic example. There are plenty of examples like the electroweak symmetry breaking phase transition that we're studying right now at the LHC where the same ideas work beautifully well. Okay? But we're not doing that very much, but I at least want to point, point that out. Play around with it yourself. Um, and, and then, like a good pharmaceutical ad, I'll speak fast and say, and write small, except when people revolts. So this is true except when it's not. And um, you can see, if you bother to write out a little bit, for example, I just said that the path integral, this is an integration variable. The integrand is symmetric if I think of J as having the symmetry. So when you do the integral, the integral, which is called exponential W, will have the symmetry. Now, if you just think through that logic, here it is. Integral dx of f of x and y, where this is equal to f of minus x and minus y. Let's agree that say that. Then this is going to be integral. So if I call this w of y, then w of minus y is equal to integral dx of f of x and minus y. And this is equal to, by using this rule, f of minus x and y. And, uh, and now I will go x prime is equal to minus x. And, and then I'll get an integral of the x prime. Jacobian is uh, minus one, but then I have to interchange the limits, minus infinity, infinity, right? So the same thing. And then you'll get f of x prime and y. So these two will be equal. Great. Right. This is, at the functional level, it's the same story. And there's only one place where you could worry, and that's calculating the 
the Jacobian here. The integrand is symmetric. What if the measure was not symmetric? Then you'd be in trouble. Okay, then you wouldn't be able to compute this group. So whatever this measure is has to be symmetric, otherwise you're good. Okay. Now, it turns out, so this is beyond the scope of this class, but I'm just saying it to keep you alert to what things you might read in private time. It turns out that there are some cases where, you know, remember the measure of the path I wrote, so that false due to non-invariance of the measure, the path I wrote measure. So you might remember that this measure is sort of seemingly innocent enough. There are Grassman versions and so on, but seemingly innocent enough. Um, except for all those ultraviolet issues that we have not yet come to, right? All of the ultraviolet divergences that might mean you have to regulate ultraviolet regulateness, put it on the lattice, and so on. And you can already see that this could give you some headaches. For example, if you put something like this on a space time lattice, the usual kind of cubic or hypercubic lattice you might think of, that already breaks, the lattice would break Lorentz and Lorentz. Okay? So it's not that obvious that then my simple statement that you're doomed to get Lorentz and Lorentz is going to work. It's going to work if you're insensitive to the ultraviolet cutoff. If for some reason you are sensitive to the ultraviolet cutoff and you can't normalize it away, you're stuck. You don't even have the symmetry. Instead of a space-time glass, I could have used something like poly -Villars. That's perfectly Lorentz and Miranda, in which case that, that issue is, is solved. But whatever symmetry you're thinking of, the issue of how you actually regulate and normalize, in other words, give meaning to the measure, suddenly matters in terms of this symmetry derivation. And you might say, don't be stupid. Choose the measure to be symmetric. What if it turns out that there's a clash of symmetries? I want this symmetry, this symmetry, this symmetry, and this symmetry. And it turns out that there's a mathematical obstruction to having all four symmetries in a regulated measure. That can happen. It does happen. And those are called, um, so these kind of essential obstructions to having a symmetric measure are called anomalies. quantum anomalies. They're quantum because you don't have to think, if you're doing tree level, the leading an eighth bar answer, at tree level, the measure, you don't have problems with ultraviolet divergences. None of these issues come up. What you see in the action is the symmetry that you get. This all happens because of the treachery of loops and quantum, higher order quantum effects that suddenly this matters. And then there can be quantum anomalies, which stop you having the symmetries. And you get to choose your poison, you see. You can say, I want Lorentz invariance, but then I have to give up this other symmetry. Or I want that symmetry, and then I'll give up Lorentz invariance. But you just can't have it all. Um, now, it turns out there are a bunch of very beautiful, I mean, a very large number of very beautiful phenomena, some even experimentally verified, which come down to this very subtle issue. You might say, this is something. No, it's got a vital and interesting role in the standard model, in puzzles of the standard model. Okay? Like, yeah, why is there more matter here than antimatter? Okay, very, very deep things that even a member of the public would say, gosh, that, that strikes me as interesting. And it comes down to this issue, and therefore I will talk about it no further. Okay? So, read about it in various places, or come and ask me. Um, again, in canonical, so in all situations, the place where you first hit it is 
you find that there are a variety of divergences that you have to deal with. And as you try to regulate it to just catch your breath before attacking it, you find that you're unable, so in all cases, you cannot find, you cannot think of a regulator that would preserve all the symmetries you want. And then you think to yourself, maybe I'm stupid. Maybe I just, I can't think of it. Somebody else would think of it. And sometimes that's true. But then, what you have are some places where there's a theorem. There's a beautiful mathematical obstruction that you can prove that if you preserve this symmetry, you must not preserve this other symmetry. And it's once you understand it at that level, so often enough you'll see sort of people talking about regulators and the failure of this regulator or that regulator. That's not quite understanding this issue. That's at least seeing that the issue comes up. But to truly understand that there does not exist the regulator that could do it, which is to say no matter what the UV physics in the sky, this is not going to go away. Once you understand that, that there does not exist a regulator, if you like, then you've understood the quantum And it appears in all sorts of different guises, and there are all sorts of interesting symmetries where it comes in. You know, for example, in string theory, a version of this kind of quantum anomaly is the thing that gives the famous prediction in superstring theory. You must have 10 dimensions of space-time. In the standard model, it's the thing that says that if you don't have um, uh, let's think of the simplest case. Like if you didn't have the top quark before it was discovered, that at the classical level you might have said it's okay. But at the quantum level, you'd be dead. Again, because of these things. There are some symmetries you wanted, and without including the top quark in the measure of the path integral, something would go wrong. So there are many, many beautiful things that come out of this, and yet. Your first, your first instinct should be the, the symmetries of this or the symmetries of this. So for many cases, that's true. Um, OK, so we did that. Um, so here is why this is such a view. So for us, what, why did we bother to invent this object? Um, there's a very beautiful theorem, which we're going to prove the first non-trivial instance of. And in some sense, that's the spirit of the entire proof. Okay? We are, we're trying to conquer ultraviolet divergences. Ultraviolet divergences do not appear in multiplying terms together. They appear in doing loops. All the loops are hidden inside of the gammas. There's not a single quantum loop that is not hidden inside the gamma. The, ga the loops that make up self-energy are hidden in gamma 2. The loops that are hidden in anything else are hidden inside the gamma n greater than 2. Because everything else to make a Green's function is just multiplied. You're not going to get divergences that way to make tree diagrams. So, as I said, all the hardness. We are about to shoot for one central insight. Right now, the quantum effective action one particle effective action can in general be non-local. So when you do loops, if you think of this as loops, in general it's non-local, meaning that x1 and x7 are not even in the same vicinity as each other. They're not even infinitesimally related. x1 is on the moon, x7 is on Earth, and so on. But we are trying to categorize the nature of any, any simplification in the structure of ultraviolet divergences. If I don't put any regulators in, or sorry, if I put a regulator in and just start calculating, then I'll be able to calculate all of this. But I'll be highly sensitive to which regulator I chose. Okay, that's what we mean by divergence. Say something that goes like cut off to the second power or cut off square or something like that. That's an ultraviolet divergence. And I'm trying to get some sense of which terms here are sensitive to the cutoff, which terms here are not sensitive to the cutoff. If I have some sign, some pattern, I have a hope in hell. Okay? And right now, it's a total mess, totally non-local, and so on. So we're about to shoot for the following theorem, that in an appropriately qualified sense, that higher loops and absolutely at one loop, ultraviolet divergences, or 
sensitivity to the cutoff is contained in gamma, but only in things which are local in X. The general, the general contribution to gamma is non-local in X, X1 on the moon and X7 on the Earth. But terms in gamma which are very sensitive to the ultraviolet cutoff are local in X, meaning that all the X's here are the same or infinitesimally related to each other, meaning one is just between these guys. This is an incredible simplification of the most general structure that you could have worried about. Okay? And that's going to help us. That's why we invent this language. This, this language makes it more methodical for what should we do about it now that we've got this example. Okay, so let's first of all um, set up to prove that result. anomalies matter in the same in the sense. The most, the most obvious place they matter is that the pi zero decay to two photons is dominated by this consideration of a quantum anomaly. And, and this turns out to be central. We have to measure hadronic, you know, hadrons coming out of whatever new physics or top board physics or whatever it is through this process. So these anomalies are ranged from the most esoteric considerations to the absolute on the ground you know, experimental issues that come up. Uh, they're everywhere. Um, okay, so the statement is ultraviolet divergences. which I mean sensitivity to UV cutoff or regulator, whatever you want to call it, only appear in local close to each other, that is gamma n divergent corresponds to
differential operators. Oh, that's so stupid. Wait. That's, that's <laughs> insane of me. Here it is. It's, uh, parts of phi bar can be written in the form of a local action. Okay. It's local, so if you want, which means that we say even more for that it is. There's some divergent Lagrangian, which depends on phi bar and derivatives. That's what I mean by local. And it's all at the point x. So, and since I have to stop, I want to just give the punchline. Why is this such a big deal? Because we are already, 